Turn in your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 5. As we go through the Gospel by John Mark, if you'll remember with me, last lesson, Jesus, they're going to the other side. Now, he's trying to get his disciples some rest. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't rested. He's been doing the ministry. He's asleep in the boat. He told them, remember, we're going to the other side. Let us go to the other side. And in the middle of it, there was a huge storm, and they were afraid. And he gets up, and they say to him, Do you care thou not that we perish? Because they think they're going to die. And I know we feel like that sometimes. There is uh, uh, different things in different people's lives where you can feel like God has forgotten you. What is going on? But he's not asleep. He never sleeps, nor does he slumber. He often comes through in the last moment. And he's wanting to stretch you and grow you and cause you to trust in him that he's got you. And it's a building of faith. Because our entire life here is about faith. And yet we allow other things to kill our faith. The Bible clearly tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, yet most of the time we ignore the Word of God. We don't look at the Word of God. We're not, we're not training ourselves to articulate and hear the Word of God and trust the Word of God. We're too busy listening to all the other voices. It's a dangerous thing for a saint not to know the voice of God. Because we tend to listen to other voices that other people are listening to, and we think it's okay. And then by the time we realize that they were not the voice of God, we can find ourselves in some really bad places. So the storm is not the voice of God, but God has allowed the storm. He's not really sleeping and slumbering as God, but as the humanity of God, Jesus he is asleep because the body will wear out. The body gets tired. He had a human body just like us. So he gets up and he rebukes the wind. He's clearly showing them that he's God. He rebukes the wind. He says to the sea, peace be still. Do you know this, God? Listen to me. Do you know this God that speaks to the wind, that speaks to the sea, and they do what he says? It's the same God that poetically we're told in the Psalms that he, that he meted out the sea. He put it from the palm of his hand, and he goes, a little water here, a little water there. That's amazing to me to think about. He doesn't just speak to it and it obeys, but he put it where it's at. He knew that it was going to be a storm, but he told them we're going to the other side, and we have this 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 entire word picture, if you will, of you and I in the fellowship, and we're going to the other side. We're going to one day be on the other side of this. We're going to be in heaven with him. We're going to be on the other side of this physical, fully living in the spiritual. Our faith will become sight. We are going to get to the other side if we stay in the boat. If we stay close to him and we do what he says, we will get to the other side. They close with, who is this? See it there? It's there in 41. They were afraid of the storm. It's in 441. And then it says they feared exceedingly and said to one another. See, the storm caused them to put their emotions, their fear, everything onto him. And see, life is caused right now. What's going on on the way to heaven is to get us to look to him. To fear him who can kill the body and cast the soul into hell. To trust him. 
And the devil, who wants to be like the Most High God, he's causing these storms. He's causing these things. He's causing COVID-19, whether he's using useful idiots or not. And he wants you to fear that instead of fear God. He wants you to focus on that instead of focus on the voice of God. So that he can be the father. See, he's the father of all lives, but he wants to be your father. He wants to control you, dominate you. He wants you to be controlled by the fear of the unknown as opposed to the knowable God. And you have to make that choice today. Do you believe that he's God? Look, they said, actually, King James doesn't say, who is this? It says, what manner of man is this? If you look at it in King James, it's what manner? What manner? It's through the idea of drawing a conclusion, and it's from a word that means to keep in suspense. See, he's trying to reveal himself by speaking to the wind and the storm, and they're still like, my goodness, who is this? See, and you may be there in your faith. You may be saying, I believe he's God. I believe in his salvation. But what manner is this? Because you're not understanding his ways. You're not understanding that he's taking you to the other side. You're not looking at the fact that he's faithful. And no matter what happens in your life, he's still moving. And you need to get in concert effort with him and listen to the Spirit and follow him so that you'll be in the perfect will of God and make it to the other side safely. Oh, make no mistake, you'll probably get to the other side, but what will you look at and what will you look like when you get to the other side? What kind of rewards will you get? How will it end up if you're not listening? If you're not hearing the voice, if you're not obeying, if you're not looking to be sanctified, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Listen to me, because that's what God's doing. God is sanctifying, setting apart, making all of you holy, not just your spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. He wants all your spirit, soul, and body to be sanctified. What does that mean? Listen to me. Your spirit positionally, instantly, when you believe, covered in the blood, is sanctified, pure, and holy. Now, because of being married, flipped back upside downward and right side with God, he wants also your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, to be sanctified. That means you're choosing to have your mind, will, and emotions line up with his voice, with his word, with his truth. So that you don't follow the lie with your mind, will, and emotions, which have been damaged. They're real. Don't get me wrong. They're real, but they've been damaged by the lies of the wicked one. And now you have to look at them through the sunglasses of the Bible and the Word of God. And you say, I fear this COVID. I fear this death. I fear this problem. But I'm in the boat with God, and he can align my emotions up with his truth. And I choose to follow him even when it's scary. And that's working on your mind, will, and emotions. Well, meanwhile, the devil is still throwing more storms. He's still throwing more battles that you're dealing with over here and over here. But God's still saying, stay in the boat. Stay in the word, prayer, and fellowship. And I am going to sanctify you and get you to the other side. Mind, will, and emotion, that's your soul and your body. See, you're beating your body in subjection. It's all of you that he wants. Your spirit, soul, and body. Your body's this flesh that tends to want to go this way when your mind's going that way. You're like, wait a minute, what's going on? My spirit, my mind, will, and emotions, I'm trying to line up, but my body's going south because it's deteriorating. It's not made to last, but right now you make it a useful servant and you beat it into subjection and you make it go the way of righteousness. But if you're not dealing with your mind, will, and emotions, the way you think, your intellect, lining it up with God's spirit, with God's word and God's truth, your mind will go and your body will follow it. That's why positionally you're sanctified in Christ. The blood covers you. Practically, your mind, will, and emotions, choices in life, 
you've been given that chance to look at it and be sanctified. And you begin to train yourself anew by the Spirit of God and the Word of God to follow God in His will. And then your body is going to do whatever your mind will and emotion tells it to do. Your body will follow your mind. If the devil gets your mind, he casts a thought in it, your body will follow it. You'll be like, I am so stupid. What am I doing? I'm trying to go over there. And you're walking sideways. So we want to surrender completely to the work of the Spirit. He's already made us blameless before our God. He loves us with a never-ending love. We're in the boat. We're going to get to the other side. Let's get to the other side. It's Mark 5.1. Then they came to the other side. Oh, they got there. Interesting. God said they would. Of the sea. No, this is not heaven. Okay? This is the other side of the sea. We're going to the other side in the analogy, testimony of God. To the country of the Gadarenes, and uh, some texts call it Genesaret, but that's when you're a Gentile. That's what it was in Gentile language. But, and Matthew and Luke both use it. But it's Gadarenes, since we're looking at the Jewish aspect of it, because Jesus is right now ministering to Jews. Listen, right now. So they get to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he, was, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with a loud voice and said, What have I to do? Did I miss something there? Yeah. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, cutting himself with stones. I did that when I was studying too, and I kept missing that last line on my Bible because it goes to the next page. Cutting himself with stones, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. See that? You can't miss that. See, I just missed that. Read past that. we got to go back and get that. Don't miss the worship part. See how easy that was for me to miss it? And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what had happened, or excuse me, what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw that one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion setting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he had, has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Father, there is such a heaviness in our world today, a hopelessness, a fear, because we have no faith. None. You said, when I come, will I even find faith? Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith. We believe, but help our unbelief. Pour out your spirit upon us. Teach us here this morning. Make this clear what the devil is trying to do to us. And make it clear how you have come to save and no one can stop you from saving. 
You have all power. Pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now he told them he's going to give them some rest. Get in the boat. We're going to the other side. What happens? They come to the other side. You can believe him always. The hard part is, is getting your mind, will, and emotions to line up with it. To begin following the Spirit who is, is actually sanctifying your mind, will, and emotions if you begin to obey. See, obedience is training your heart, training your mind, will, and emotions, training your body to do it even when you don't understand it. So as you begin to obey, you begin to retrain your heart in the truth instead of the lie that we've always followed, the habits that we've always followed. I was talking with my grandbaby on the way to church, and I told her, you're training your heart right now for your adulthood. See, and you're training your heart right now for when you're mature. You'll be able to tell others. You'll be able to walk properly. The Spirit will lead you. If you're in the boat and you know Jesus, now you have to trust Him. Now you have to obey Him. You don't have to be afraid. If you are afraid, the good news is you can run to Him. That's what they did. They woke him up and said, you care not if we're perishing. And then he showed them clearly by testimony as he spoke that there was nothing to worry about. He spoke to the wind. He spoke to the water. He rebuked them. He muzzled them. He created them. 5 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea. Now, I'm not going to go into the analogy where the sea is sometimes referred to like many waters. It's all the land. It's all the people. It's the nations, tongues. To the country of the Gadarenes. Do you remember the Gadarenes? Notice Gadarenes. Why am I not saying Genesaret? Because I'm not talking about Gentiles. See, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh decided they want to camp out on one side of the Jordan, and the rest of them went across into God's salvation. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh become a type of a cultural Christian who doesn't enter in fully into the will of God and cross the Jordan. God allowed Moses to give them that land but they had to go across and fight for the rest of the land with the rest of the tribes. Then they came back. You go back in the Old Testament, you see all this. I won't stand there long. But the reason we're calling it the Gadarenes is because of the tribe of Gad that was there. It reminds us that they didn't enter fully into the faith of God, into the promise of God. But they stayed back over here in the culture, in a place that they liked. And you know what the fear is? When the enemy comes, those that are on this side are the first to get attacked. They're the first to be lost. And it's easiest if you stay close to the world and close and away from the promises of God to get taken captive. When Jesus shows up and brings the boys to the other side, they got swine. They're pig farmers, and they're never even supposed to touch swine. So the Gadites are totally apostate. That's the point of this text, that they've walked so far away from God that they're doing the demons' work. They're full of demons. Everything's going on. They're doing the devil's work. Listen, if you're not underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ, you're doing the devil work. You become a useful idiot for the devil. I don't like to put it that way. It's just the truth. You can think you're okay with God, but if you're not actively looking to hear his voice and obey him and follow him and be sanctified, not just your spirit, but your soul and body, then you're actually still living in the world, following the world, and I call that culturality. It doesn't mean you're not going to be saved. It may mean you're not saved at all. But it means that your rewards, it means that your trip on your way across the sea into heaven is going to be very, very difficult. You're not going to understand the battles. You're not going to know how to pray. You're not going to be looking to be discipled or disciple others because you're not doing the will of God. You just say, I'm in the boat. 
Church is not important. Bible reading is not important. And none of those things become important because you are on the wrong side of the argument, the wrong side of your faith, the wrong side of the boat, the wrong side of the Jordan. Instead of stepping clear in and fully knowing what manner of man this is, fully knowing who this man is. See, they're still in question. Are you? Do you know this God? Are you coming to know him more every day? Do you know what manner of man Jesus is? Have you investigated? Have you searched it out? Have you put all your eggs in one basket, proverbially, so that you know that no matter what happens, I got nowhere to go? You have the words of eternal life. And have you surrendered? Surrendered your mind, will, and emotions and your body for the work of the ministry. <clears throat> no matter what it costs. So it's called gatherings because of Gad that is there. And we're going to find that they're dealing in pigs. And Leviticus 11, 7 which tells them that they were never supposed to eat anything with a split hoof or chewed the cut. Is that what it is? That they were unclean to them. So we're going to see unclean spirits. We're going to see unclean practices by a tribe of Israel that have been totally taken captive to do the will of the devil. And they're going to even, listen, shocking apostasy, they're going to ask Jesus to leave. And much of Christianity today, they ask Jesus to leave the building because they're too busy with their entertainment. They're too busy with their careers. They're too busy with their intellect. They're too busy trying to stay politically correct. They're too busy believing the lies of the devil. So they actually, in their choices, ask Jesus to leave their house, to leave the room. Listen to me. It's very difficult, but this is something that I've been fighting with. The devil doesn't want me to get up here and tell you this. He doesn't want me to tell you anything about Jesus except for a cultural message that makes you feel good, tickles your ears, has no power to it, and you go out and you keep doing what you've always done and think you're okay. The Gadarenes. It's a town east of the Jordan. Not in the center of God's will. They're coming short of the glory of God. They're taken captive. And when we find them years later, they're dealing in unclean. And they don't know God. They're dealing in the lewd and demonic the impure. Verse 2. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately, there's our word, what is it, 26 times? Immediately, he's moving quick. Moving quick. The book of Mark moves quick, and it shows more miracles than any other book. And some of them are only in this book. They're not in the other ones. This one happens to be in Matthew 8 and in Luke 8 also. They tell it a little bit differently than Mark does. Immediately moves quick. You also see a lot of fights. Here's, here's the thing. You see the huge battle in Mark more than you see it in other books, other testimony. Mark really brings out the spiritual warfare. There's a lot about the demons and the unclean spirits and Jesus speaking, and we see the power over them. We see that they obey, the wind and everything obeys, and it's you and I that have to make the choice. Are we going to obey? The universe obeys, the demons obey, but what are we going to do? Because in obeying, we get sanctified. The sanctification, that means being set apart for his will. We talked about this so many times. It's kind of acquainted to consecrated. Consecrated. They consecrated the implements in the temple, the cups, the spoons, all the shields, all those stains that end up getting taken away when they go into captivity. We're in that in First Kings chapter fourteen. They were taken away from Rehoboam. 
because they began to compromise and follow the other ten tribes, and they began to follow their own will. So they lost all the gold shields which Solomon made. And Solomon is a type of Christ, and gold refers to deity. And they had all these gold shields, our shields of faith, right? Right? But then when they began to compromise, they let the enemy come in. The enemy took the gold shields of faith. And you know what, he, you know what Rehoboam replaced them with? Anybody know? Bronze shields. Which bronze or brass always stands for judgment. And so now they put bronze shields up on the wall. We haven't even covered this yet. We were supposed to cover it. We haven't covered it yet. And we replaced it. So then our fear of the world and fear of everything else comes in because we're still living in a mindset, a heart set of judgment instead of freedom, instead of deity, instead of our sanctification being working. We're still living in our works. We're still living in this judgment age, even though we say we're Christians. And our shields of faith are not by God's faith and because of his word, they're little bronze shields that's always keeping us feeling guilty, always keeping us feeling afraid, always keeping us from marching forward in the kingdom of God and living for God. Listen, when things get, the battle gets rough, when the storms become heavy, it's not time to shut up. It's time to stand up. It's time to speak up. It's time to stand out. It's time to show that we trust God even more. The devil wants to silence your faith, but God wants to grow your faith. What the devil means for bad, God will use it for good if you keep your eyes fixed on him. And know that, yes, he does care if you perish. The whole reason he came was so that you would not perish. The whole reason he died was so that you would not perish. Everything about him. Watch when he gets to the island right here. He gets to the other side. Listen, man has already given up on this guy that we're getting ready to meet. Legion. Legion has given up on himself. In the next text, the next miracle, the woman has used all the doctors there is possible, and they've given up. They've taken all of her money. But God doesn't give up. He came for this purpose to save us. He came so that we would not perish. We were already perishing, and he came to give us life. So our hope and our faith and our trust must be placed in his salvation, in his deliverance. I keep getting ahead of myself because I get excited when I see the whole of the, or when God shows it to me is what I should say instead of when I see it because it's not something that I did. It's something that he reveals as you begin to look into it. He uncovers it. So we're uh, in the region of the Gadarenes. We're in that area. It's also the region of Genesaret. There are cities that are right next to each other. But Gad is the Jews. Genesaret is the Gentiles. Genesaret quite possibly was the bigger city because of the apostate Jews. They all blended in. But Jesus wants us to focus on the Holy Spirit. Mark wants us to see that he's speaking specifically to the Jews at this time. This is why he's still with us and we haven't got into the Gentile age yet. Immediately there met him out of the tombs. That's the graveyard. That's what we would call it. The tombs is the place they bury the dead. It's where all the bones are at. It's really caves that have uh, uh, holes dug in them. A man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling. He had his dwelling among the graveyards, among the tombs, among the graves and the dead. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. Now listen to me. Physically, they can't control him, but the devil's got him in bondage completely spiritually, living in the tombs, living with the dead. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I used to run with people like this. And it's a scary thing. I was people like this. You might have been people like this. It's a scary thing when you see raw demonic power. And demons, think about it. They're fallen angels. Uh, and they have lots of power. But it has to stay where God tells them their boundaries are at. Just like the sea, 
just like the wind, just like the water. They can't do anything that God doesn't tell them to do or give them permission to do. You're seeing them ask permission in this text even. But I was, uh, uh, in, in, in the old man, I was in a situation with some people and we were being arrested and they put riot straps. You ever seen riot straps? They put riot straps on my buddy and he went off and it was demonic and he snapped them off and they freaked out. He's like, no. And I've seen it many times out of him and probably they've seen it many times out of me. But you get crazy when you, I mean, it's just crazy. That's why they call it spirits, by the way. See, we're changing that now, though, ain't we? They used to call it spirits. Now we call it, and we put billboards up to make it look really glamorous and nice to drink bourbon and all those spirits that open up realms of demons. And we go, oh, it's not a bad thing. You know, the government calls it sin tax. Why is it not a bad thing? It's a sin tax because they know that they're opening up realms of demons. I went off into a different realm, but here we go back. It's an unclean spirit. If you want to know what unclean means, it means impure. It means lewd. It means demonic. It means foul. You're going to see over in the rest of the text that it's called, it's called demons. It's called devils in the King James. I don't like that. There's one devil. There's one Satan. But it's, it's his henchmen that have the same mindset as him and the same or marching orders as him. But it's demons. I believe it's fallen angels that came down with Satan. And they're listening to Satan. It's calling it unclean. It's in contrast completely to the Holy Spirit, which is pure and holy and undefiled. That's who we're supposed to be following, the Holy Spirit, not unclean spirits. However, when you start calling it culture entity, you start calling it all these other things, a lot of the church is following the culture and thus following unclean spirits even in the teaching of the Bible. And we have to be very careful with that. And I'm going to show you that in a minute in 2 Timothy chapter 2. But give me a couple minutes before we go there. So here's this. He can't be tamed. Uh, he's really given up on himself just like they've given up on him. Because he's in the, in the graveyard. I get, oh, I, I need to tell you. In Matthew Matthew has two guys. If you go read it, you got you got to go. You got to study these things out. Luke does one guy. Matthew does two guys. Right? No contradiction. No lie. No problem. Unless you are a skeptic of the Bible and a skeptic of God. And let me just let me just show you that we're focusing on the Jewish guy. I believe this guy's Jewish. The other guy was probably Gentile. They're both there in the graveyard. There's lots of people full of demons. But Jesus wants us to focus on the Jew. That's what we're focusing on. The Gadites. That's what we're focusing on. That's what Mark is doing with us. And it's the same thing as if um, you were watching the graduations out here yesterday. And, and, and you're watching them drive by and drive around and honk and toot. And, and you said something about so-and-so and the yellow car and the red car. And that's all you're talking about because it's in your perceptual field. That's what you see because it's your cousin that graduated. But it's not a contradiction if I'm talking about the blue car and the other three people and that there was a hundred cars. It's just I'm adding to it. If you see, We all tell it differently because we see it differently and we have a different point to make. You're going to see here in a minute that there was other people there, not just two guys probably with demons, but there's people that, that, that were shepherding the herd of swine. But none of them are mentioned. It's like if there's a car wreck out here, and I call you and I go, man, there's a big car wreck, and there's five police cars down here. And you follow behind, and you're about an hour behind me, and you go, what are you doing lying to me? There's not just five police cars. There's like two fire trucks. They're, they've got an ambulance there. they got paramedics out giving a guy. I'm like, well, I, would just tell, I just noticed the police cars. I've seen all the rest of that. I was just telling you there's five police cars. I wasn't giving you the, the run of the mill. And then there's this going on and there's that going on. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't confuse the story. It, it doesn't do anything except it, it, they're all working in concert. They agree with one another, just like the four Gospels. One of them is not wrong because they tell it 
the way the Holy Spirit gave it to him. Just like if you go home today and you're listening to some other pastor on the radio on the way home and he's sharing the same text. God has given him a different message that means the same thing from the same text. Unless, of course, he's following the spirit of demons and he's teaching it wrongly. He's teaching it some way that will lead you astray and teach it you so you'll stay in the tombs. You'll stay in the deception. You'll stay in culturanity because Christ come down to set us free so that we would worship him. But they work in concert together. There's no contradiction. Uh, it's just different ways of telling the exact same thing from a perspective that you want to get across the truth. So, unclean, he has a demon. Verse 5, always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, the, 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 the cutting um, and cry, uh, listen to this, crying means this, to croak as a raven. See, birds are evil, except for the dove. They're, they represent evil. The birds of the air, we've seen them steal the seeds from the heart. It's a shriek. And cutting, this, this means to chop down or mangle. Because you know, you're going to mangle something if you're cutting yourself with a rock, a sharp rock. You're mangling self. You remember in the Old Testament, that's how they worshipped. On, on, on Mount Carmel, the priests worshipping their false gods, they cut themselves and cried out to their god. Because it's a demon. There's no other god but one. So we see what's going on. He's in the tombs. He's living in death. He's cutting himself. He's screaming. He's got everybody terrified. And it, it, let me just stop for a minute. The first thing the devil wants you to do is believe that he's not real. That's the first deception. That's why Jesus always says, careful that you're not deceived. Because somebody's going to tell you some things and they're going to go, oh, well, if you don't consciously do that in your heart and you don't do this in your heart and you're not, listen, Everything about your life, you're making a judgment and a decision. Am I going to obey God's truth or am I going to flee him and not obey him? Listen, and the devil's trying to deceive you. How did we get in this position? He deceived Eve. Listen to me. Deception is going on. You have to make a judgment decision. Is this the spirit of God or is this deception? In everything that you're doing now, because now you're a spiritual person if you believe in Jesus. And there's an enemy trying to deceive you. Now, don't freak out and go, ah! Because if God be for you, who can be against you? And if you have a heart to obey Him and be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body, you're looking to do the will of God. He's got you. You're in the boat. You're like, every time something happens, you're like, careful we perish? Oh, okay, got wisdom now. And I can go forward. We're getting to the other side? Okay, just, just check him if you're still in the boat. Just making sure I wasn't following some lie. You're still in the boat, Jesus? Good, we're here. So you always want to make sure Jesus is in the boat. If Jesus ain't in the boat, you want to get out of that boat, get back in Jesus' boat. There's other boats in that water right now going across. They're all trying to act like they're going to the other side. Which boat are you in? Are you in the fellowship? Yeah, because in the King James, it's ship. Fellowship, which means we have all things in common. All things in common with who? Jesus first, then with each other. Problem is in the church today, it's so politically correct, it's culturality. What we do is we try to have all things in common with each other, and then we tell people that's Christianity. But if it's not with fellowship with God first to have all things in common with Him, and then we pass it along to others to have all things in common with Him, it becomes a religious institution based upon works that looks pretty but denies the power thereof. So it's got to start with fellowship with him. Is he in the boat? Most of Christianity today does not have Jesus in the boat because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. And what does they happen? Just like here in this text, they've asked him to leave because they don't want to obey him. They just want to look pious and pretty. And the truth is, ain't none of us pious, ain't none of us pretty. Our righteousness is in Christ. And if we're not obeying we don't look very righteous. We need to be obeying Him. So 
he's crying, he's cutting himself. So the devil is real. That's the first thing I want you to get because most people, I, it's, seriously, you talk to people who are Christians, they don't even believe the devil's real. Oh, you believe God is real, but you don't believe the devil's real. Yeah, I, I really, I just think it's our bad decisions that that's the, that's the devil. We kind of made it. Oh, oh, okay. So when Jesus talked more about the devil and hell in the Bible than he did about anything else, you think that he was messed up in his theology? Well, they don't read the Bible. That's the first problem here. They've made up their own little religion that fits their culture so they can keep, and they go to church every week, but they don't read the truth. What they do is they're living a lie so that they feel good. They're practicing religion so that they feel good, but they're not working on their mind, will, and emotions, which is being sanctified by God if you start to obey. You retrain your entire mind, will, and emotions. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it was painful. Yes, it's bad. Yes, it was a disaster and it was sin committed. But God restores all things. He redeems all things. He comes to save souls. So your emotions can be real, but you don't have to follow them anymore or you'll end up in a ditch. You want to line them up with God's word and let them be retrained into God's kingdom. So when I first got saved, I, just, I like to tell you this because I think it's something that's wise. If anybody's been messing with the occult, and there's a lot of it out there. In fact, the church is steeped in a cult. The church has got these dream catchers hanging all over their houses. They've got yoga all over their houses. This is a cult. This is demonic. This is what happened to Israel. This is how Israel got defeated and missed the Messiah, was they put all of this stuff, they adopted all the culture around them instead of standing and telling people about God. They adopted everything that came in, and they said, look, look at all of this. And so we've got astrology. Listen to me. If you've ever dealt with these, these are demonic. They're run by demons. The Ouija board, the, the, the eight ball, all of those things are demonic. Much of music, much of literature that is written, much of the TV you watch on TV today, if not 100% of it, is demonic. It's being run by demons. The demons are real. They want to lead you to make you feel good, but they're training your heart not to be sanctified, not to have faith in God. They want to make you fear and follow their dangling carrot so that the father of all lies can be your father. The father of all lies is the one that's the captain of your ship. And when you go, you care for not perishing, oh, you're fine. Just keep doing that evil that you're doing. You'll be good. You said a prayer once. It'll be okay. And it's a lie from the pit of the hell. God wants to sanctify not just your spirit, which is positional, but your soul, which is your body, or your, your mind, will, and emotions. And he wants your body. See, just as this demon possessed this guy, and there's going to be maybe 12,000 demons, possessed him, controlled his body. See, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our body. And Jesus can live through us as we obey him. And this man is obeying the demon spirit. It's the same type of thing. The devil wants to be like God. So he does the same thing that God does, but he does it all for bad, all in sin, all to destroy and kill. God comes and he's bringing life. And that more abundantly. And everything he does is to train you and teach you so you can live in his kingdom and you can help him find others that are lost that are willing to come to him. That's the contrast. Unclean spirit, clean spirit. The Holy Spirit is clean, wants you to obey Him. Just thought that I turn on my microphone, so I looked down. Did you see that? Because the last two weeks I didn't turn it on until later when Chuck's going, ah! <laughs> Sorry. Listen, listen to me. The devil is real. I remember when I got saved, that was my point I was trying to make. I go to a prayer meeting. I haven't been saved very long, and I want to live for Jesus. You know what I did? I recanted on the Ouija board and all of that evil stuff that had been in my life. I said, men, will you gather around me and pray over me? And I want to deny that there was that, that any of that power, any of that influence that happened in my life because I was playing with astrology. I was playing with the Ouija board. I thought it was real fun to do all of these occultic things. Because the power is really there. It's just that Jesus has boundaries on it. And he allows the devil to deceive you and to use you and abuse you until you cry out to him. And once you become his, he puts the halt on the devil. 
And he has no more power over you. Unless you decide that you want to give it back to him. And you don't want to be sanctified. And you think you're so tough and strong and cool. That you're going to stay living in self. And not be sanctified. And not follow through with your salvation. And be delivered. See, it's, it's a process. It's not a one-time prayer. That's the beginning of the process that God's doing in his redemption. And as long as we keep making the decision not to let God sanctify us and cleanse us with the washing of the water through the word, the devil can still beat us up. Listen to me. So I had to lay hands on me and pray and cast out anything that might be or anything that I thought that I might have or, or anything that could have happened because we all dabble in it because the whole world does. I mean, think about it. I grew up watching Bewitched. Many of you did too. It was demonic. And my, my, what is it, My Little Pony? It's demonic. It's teaching us that it's okay to have little demonic stuff or the cartoons with the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. This is all demonic. Or I Dream of Genie, demonic. We have to really think about it because it trains our heart. It trains our mind, will, and emotions, which are supposed to be sanctified now. And most of Christianity, we, we still have Harry Potter and Draculas and all kinds of stuff in our houses, which is evil. It's the occult. It's the devil trying to keep you from being sanctified and keep you under his control. He wants to dominate you and kill you. He came to rob, kill, and destroy. He didn't come to give you life. Christ came to give us life. And he wants you to worship him instead of the devil. So what happens with this guy? Look, watch what's going on. Verse 6. I'll never get done with this text. This is a message that's huge that the church needs to hear and they need to wake up to. When he saw Jesus from afar. Jesus was cooking fish on afar. Oh, never mind. That's hillbilly. I'm a hillbilly. He ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now, I read some stuff, and some people said that this is going on, and that's going on, and this is like bipolar, and he's, he's our, one side saying that the man is speaking, the other side is the demon speaking. Listen, the demon speaking. You can figure out something else if you want. The demon speaking. The demon knew instantly he was Jesus, the most high God. The demon came and worshipped him. The man that's, a, that's the demoniac, we don't even find out his name. We find out the demon's name. The, the man has no idea who Jesus is. The demons know, though they've been in heaven, they're fallen angels. He's the one that comes and bows down and wants to worship God. He's begging him not to do what? Cast him into the abyss is what it comes down to. Because he knows that that is his place at the end of all of this. Do not tor me, torment me before the time. Don't cast me into the abyss. They're all going to end up in the deep, the abyss. All the demons eventually. The question is, do you know who Jesus is, what manner of man he is, and do you know where you're going? That's the question. These demons are worshiping. These demons are obeying. These demons are asking permission. These demons are, 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 are talking to Jesus because they know who he is, and they know they're expected in. The question is, is do we know truth? Do we know where we're going? Do we know what manner of man he is? Do we understand, really, or is this just some story? Oh, they were in the boat, and Jesus spoke to the wind, and he spoke to the water. No, this is God in the boat with you, and he commanded the wind to stop. He commanded the water to be still. And then he rebuked the disciples and said, have you no faith? And he wanted us to see that there's not a hair on your head. There's not an ingrown toenail on your foot. There's not a pain or anything that you're going through that he doesn't fully 100% know about. And he came to give you life and he cares about. And he wants you to bring all things to him. See, I believe this actually started with, and it's another back in chapter 3, when they accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub. 
And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Then the house is divided, it's going to fall. Because unless a strong man can, can overtake and plunder the house, you can do nothing. See, Jesus is that man. And if Jesus is in the house, the devil can't do nothing because he has all power and all authority. Jesus has all power and all authority. The problem is we don't get that. I don't think we get that. All. How much is it? Get out a calculator. You got a calculator on you? Add this up. A-L-L. -L. In the Greek, it's all. He has everything. Think about it. So when he comes... And he sets you free. You're free indeed. And you can go forward and worship. You can go forward and do what he's called you to do. And the demons can't bother you unless you give them power. Unless you give them strength. Unless you ignore sanctification. What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Demons have nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing. They already rejected him in heaven. They rejected God. See, hell was never made for flesh and blood. You and I. It was never made for that. Hell was made for fallen angels that rejected God. And salvation was not created. Jesus didn't come to deliver angels that have fallen. He came to deliver flesh and blood. And the devil wants us to take his punishment with him and go to hell with him. And he would rather you do that than ever worship God. He just don't want you to worship God. But he knows that he can steal and deceive you and let you worship him down here if you just live for self. See, we think that living for self is, ah, I'm really not hurting nobody but myself. That's the way I lived all of my life. Unless you got in my space, then I'd hurt you. And that's wrong. I'm just saying it. That's the way I lived. Listen, if you're not worshiping God and bow down to him, you're serving Satan. And Satan gets your worship freely by deceiving you. You're worshiping him because you're not worshiping God. And that's all he wants is you not to worship God. And then he wants you to die not worshiping God, not surrendering to God. The word worship means it's like a dog licking his master's hand. It means to prostrate yourself before God humbly and beseech him. It's because he has all power and all authority. Think about this for a minute because the text is going to kind of end where he, he gives this compassion upon this man. He compassionates is what it means. He gives us grace and mercy that we don't even know we need it. This man has given up on himself. The community has given up on this man, and Jesus didn't. He, he took all the disciples. He's trying to get them rest. He's trying to get them safely to the other side, and he stopped on the island of Gadarenes because he was looking to save a soul. He stopped for that one man. Because he was looking to save a soul. A man that's got maybe 12,000 demons. Watch this. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll come back to the text. Around about, he worshipped. And the demon says, I adjure you, King James. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Torment means to toss or to torture. See, he thinks he's, he's asking him to... Promise me you're not going to torment me now. You're not going to cast me into the abyss now. And he says in verse 8, For he said to him, Come out of the man, demon, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? He answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country, out of that region. What? He begged him, let me stay here. See, you can't see the spiritual kingdom, but you know where the spiritual damage is being done. You know where they put all the bars and the spirits. They put it in a place where the people are willing to live that way. And see, these demons are in an area where they're all pagan. They're all Gentile. They're not, they're not close to the temple. They're not trying to worship God. They stop short of the Jordan and going into the promised land. So those demons want to go to places where they can live through people and possess them easier. 
And then they come to the church in a different way. They come in as wolves in sheep's clothing. They come in with false doctrine and spirit of Antichrist, but they smile and look like they're doing right and look like they're teaching you good. But out there in those regions of the gatherings, they're willingly picking up swine. They're willingly selling swine. They're willingly touching unclean stuff. And it's cool to do that. I said to my grandbaby this morning, I said, you're not mean. She goes, yes, I am. And I said, do you know that it's bad to be mean? See, we've made good look bad and bad look good. Uh, uh, e evil look good in our communities. It, you're, if you're bad or you're mean or you're tough, it's supposed to be a nice thing. Really? In the Christian community? See, and we bring that all into our Christian culture and we act like we're living for God. We dress like we're tough. We, dr we dress like the world. We act like the world. We live like the world. And we say we're Christians. Wait a minute, those things are evil. Horoscopes, I mean, these things that are common. Harry Potter. You can get 99% of the church to argue with you that Harry Potter's okay. You can get 99% of the church to argue with you that yoga exercise is okay. And it's another religion serving a false god. Well, I'm not doing that, but it's not consciously. No, you're being deceived, just like Eve was. You're not consciously serving that God. You're doing it in deception. If you knew it was conscious, you would stop. But you're not understanding that you're being deceived by a demon. That's exactly what the Bible tells us, that the Antichrist, spirit of Antichrist, went out to deceive the elect. The spirit of Antichrist is deceiving and being, I mean, we're being deceived. That's what happened with original sin. Drives me crazy. Shamanism. These dream catchers are shamanism. And I see them. They, we put crosses in the middle of them. Are you kidding me? It's demonic. I know. He's just some crazy screaming guy. But my people perish for lack of knowledge. And whether it's COVID-19 or a dream catcher or reading your astrology and following the stars... Whether it's, it's straight in your face, all oh, them Mormons, they're bad. Them Catholics are bad. What about all the other stuff that we brought in our houses that is horrible evil that's training our heart that it's okay? And we'll argue. I've had so many people argue with me. So many pastors will argue with me that secular music's not bad for you. It might not send you to hell, but I guarantee you it'll mess with your sanctification. I guarantee you it'll deceive you. I guarantee you it's trained in your heart. Why else would we have little Sunday school kids sing the Bible? It's trained in their heart. Well, let's look at it over here in the world then. The commercials, everything that we're watching, it's training the heart in lies. And you can't get away from it, but you have to be aware of it. You have to be awake to it. We have to wake up. I mean, this demon was this demon was so concerned about when he was going to die, when he was going to get cast into the abyss. He knew his future. He ran to Jesus and bowed down in worship, hoping he wouldn't get cast into the abyss that day. Begging that he wouldn't. And we say, I love Jesus. I give my heart to God. And we don't even pray to ask about life and godliness and our future. And this demon was concerned and did. Well, there's a bunch of demons, but one of them was a spokesman. I believe, anyway. That's my... My name is Legion. Jesus spoke clearly with power, just as he did the wind and the sea, and he said, come out of him. And that demon is like, uh-oh, where do I go? I have nowhere to go. There's nobody else around to go to that's willing to accept me. That's when people get playing with demons. You've got to be very careful that when you're trying to cast a demon out of somebody, that there's not a bunch of unsaved people around because that demon's going to look for a body to go in. You want to make sure other people are saved, and you don't want to be playing games because this is real stuff. We make movies of stupid stuff, and we have been making them for years to deceive people to thinking that that's what it looks like. Legion. Now, there's a lot of controversy Legion can, uh, to different sources. Legion, uh, a Roman, Gentile, Roman Legion is 6,000 men, but some people say it's 12,000 men. 
Another one says it's 6,000 men, but then there's a 6,000 troops that are there. They're ready to back it up. But another one says three to 6,000. I don't know. But he says my name's Legion because what? We're many. So we don't even know how many demons is in this guy, but there's many. But his name is Legion because there's a whole bunch. There's a whole army of demons in this guy. So, obviously, I don't know if you've ever dealt with this, but I even had a guy that was a Christian when I was a men's program manager at a place, and this guy loved him. He had, he had given up on it. He loved you. He loved you to lay hands on him and try to cast out the demons, and he'd play games, and he'd speak to you in a demon voice, he'd speak to you in his own voice. So, make no mistake, it can happen whether you speak with your intellect and then you speak with a demon, too. And he liked doing it. He was happy living that way. He thought it brought him attention, and he was okay. That's why God would come to you and say, do you want to be made well? Do you know who I am? Do you want to live for me? Do you want to be sanctified? Or do you like your sin and you want to lay down in it? He asks us those questions and we go, I don't know why he's asking me, do I want to be made well? Because some of us are playing games. And we don't really want to be made well. Legion. Because we are many. But notice again, he's worshiping and begging. It means it, it's the word pray. It means to pray to him, beseech him. He's begging, besought in the King James. It means to pray, to exhort, to call near. Don't send us out of this region. It's a good place to hang out. Don't pull the bars out of this part of town because they love it down here and demons can hang out and their activity can go on and they can be a depressed area where the demons are having their way. couldn't help but with what is your name think of Jacob I had a quote on it somewhere Jacob remember Jacob Genesis 32 27 he's wrestling with God Jacob means a deceiver supplanter liar and he is went to Laban's and he's got all this stuff and he's coming back to his brother Esau. He's coming back to his homeland. And, and, and he's supposed to, to be being sanctified by God, learning by God. And God, look at all this stuff God gave me and he's doing for me and he's blessing me. And in that night, you know what he did? Because he's so afraid of the world. He's so afraid of Esau. He's so afraid of his brother instead of fearing God. You know what he did? He divided up all of his stuff like, hmm, Wife number two. Yeah, I don't care if she dies. I put her over there, closer to Esau. Uh, let's see. Uh, this property. And he divides it all up in three different areas. And so that Esau could kill that stuff first and this stuff first. And he thinks he's planning it out in his own little heart, his own little strength, his own little mind. And that's what God wants to take out of us, our own strength. And then finally, about midnight, he can't get to sleep. So he gets up and takes his wife that he loves and those kids. And he goes over to another place. And then it says, a man wrestled with him. God wrestled with him. Jesus Christ, the Christophany. And, and, and Jacob is hanging on to him. He won't turn loose. And I hope you're hanging on to God. So God touched his hip. And his hip came out of socket. So that he walked with a limp the rest of his life. But he's like, bless me, bless me. And he says, you know, he says to him, he says, what's your name? You're thinking, what? We've been fighting all night long and you want to know what my name is? What's your name? Jacob. God, I'm a supplanter. I'm a deceiver. I keep living in my strength. I like religion. He's just confessing to God who he is. He's getting real with God. And God says, I'm going to call you Israel now. One governed by God is what it means. 
when you begin to surrender, he wants to sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. But you have to surrender. You have to confess who you are and what's going on in your life. Esau was never an enemy. We're fighting with God. When we become God's property, nobody else is an enemy anymore. It's all between you and whether you're going to listen to, the, to your flesh or to the world or to Satan. Or are you going to listen to God? Which voice are you going to listen to? What's your name? Name is always talking about your character, your nature, your authority. What's your name? I'm a child of the Most High God. What's your name? See, he's going to give us a new name. But right now, what's your character? What's going on in your life? How are you living? See, it was important to Jesus to say, what's your name? And who was leading? The man wasn't. He was being yanked around by demons. The demon answers and says, legion, for we are many. The man had no name. His authority was by demons. Let me ask you, what's your name today? Are you being honest with God? You're getting real with God? Confessing your sin with God? Are you ready to be sanctified by God and used for his purposes? What's your name? Now a large herd of swine was feeding in the near mountains. So all the demons begged. Now there's a bunch of voices going off. Begged him, begged Jesus, saying, and it means prayed. Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission, gave them leave. King James allowed it. He gave them liberty. He permitted it. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Deviled ham. Look at that. Flying pigs. Don't tell Peter Jesus killed a bunch of pigs. Is it Peter that's mad about animals? Don't tell them about the flood either. They'll be real mad that God killed every animal except for the seven sets and the twos. Oh, don't tell them. Because this is not the Jesus that people preach today, that he would kill animals like this, or he would allow it. Notice he allowed the 2,000 pigs to die. Kind, caring, gentle Jesus was more worried about the soul of the man than he was about the pigs. Okay? He was more worried about the soul of a man than he was about the trees and the whales. It's, he came to die to give you life. He's worried about souls. But notice what happened. Jesus knew it was going to happen. That, that vast amount of demons, no matter how many it was, the pigs couldn't handle it. See, the demons need a body to control, to possess, to lead around, and to use. Just like the Holy Spirit wants you to surrender and be led by him. The demons don't ask for surrender. They just take over. But every time you say yes, they take over more. Notice that the man, or two men if you will, they never jumped off the steep slope. The demon come to kill them, but the demon also wants to use them to bother other people, to affect other people. And Jesus never gave the demons permission to make him jump off the cliff. He allowed it with the pigs. There's a lot of things we can try to bring out of that, but I'm not going to stretch it because it's not in the text. I'm just going to stop there. That God protected that soul until he would come and restore that soul. But the pigs couldn't handle that much evil. And they ran down the slope and they died. But notice the demons ask for permission because 
The devil can do nothing. Demons can do nothing to you specifically unless God gives them permission. Now, practically, the same way, the same way that everything else goes on, the demons have already been given permission to run Hollywood, to promote sin, to throw bars in places, to encourage you with a TV or whatever it is that you use in sin. They've already been given permission to deceive the populace because the whole world don't need to sway the wicked one. But then when you become somebody that God's dealing with, they have to ask specific permission and boundaries. Now there's many who say that a true Christian cannot be possessed. And I agree. Because of our text that if a strong man binds the previous master and plunders him. He can rule that house. But I want you to look at a couple of texts with me. We're going to be here for a while. Look at Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 43. Listen to me. Because in a general sense, all of us are born with an unclean spirit. In a general sense, we don't all have to be demon-possessed. But because of original sin, all of us are born dead and separated from God. And Christ comes and he gives us all life if we'll believe. And he removes the influence of that unclean spirit. It removes the influence of the devil if we will let him sanctify us. That's what he's doing. He's purifying us. He's making us more like him, which is like the spirit, which is holy. It's in stark contrast to the unclean. You become clean positionally, but practically... Your soul and your mind or your body need to follow. That's the rest of salvation. Look at this in uh, 1243. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man and goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. See, that spirit needs a body. When it leaves somebody, it goes and looks for another body to possess, to control, to dominate, to, to use for its jollies or whatever evil it wants to do. It's looking everywhere and it finds nowhere. Look what it says, 44. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. He goes back to the body he was cast out of. And when he comes, he finds it, look, empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first so shall it also be with this wicked generation. Listen, empty. This is speaking of sanctification. Empty. If you're not filling your house, your mind, will, and emotions, your heart with the things of God, furnishings of God, the word, prayer, and fellowship of God, learning to obey God, your new house with treasures of God, when he comes back, because you just said a prayer, and you became pure, and, and, and positionally perfect, and swept clean, and empty, when he comes back, if you're not growing, if you're not furnishing, he's going to find it empty, there's no strong man there to keep him out. He can come right back in with seven more demons, more powerful, because we ignore discipleship. We ignore sanctification. We ask God to leave because we're not going forward with God. Listen, that's why we're commanded to make disciples, not believers. We're commanded to be witnesses and give testimony so that God can bring people to salvation. And then we're commanded to make disciples, not believers. And what are we commanded to do? To teach them to obey. Because as you obey, your soul, your mind, will, and emotion is being retrained to make your body obey God. And you're being sanctified fully until you see Jesus face to face. But saying a prayer is just a starting line. Now, there's people with deathbed conversions. They can say a prayer on the cross. They don't have time for all that because when you see him, you're just like him, and all of that's finished. But you can't ignore the rest of the race and the rest of the process 
and then expect to see him face to face and him not judge you and cast you into hell. Because it's all about his name, his character, his nature, his will. It's all about his authority. And if you're not being sanctified, then you're still being deceived and used by the devil for his glory. So are you filling your house up with the word of God, prayer, fellowship, learning to obey, learning to articulate his voice? Look at 2 Timothy. We'll get finished here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Is that right? 2 Timothy chapter 2. My goodness, I want to read the whole chapter and teach the whole chapter. You can go read the whole chapter. I would give it to you as homework because it talks about uh, discipleship is how it opens. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Faithful men, not rich men, not tall men, not short men, men who are going to take it and give it to other people. Faithful men. And guess what? You can only be faithful when you're submitting to God, when you're in the Word of God, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Nobody's going to be faithful to God in their flesh, only when you're surrendering. If you keep going, no one called to be a soldier entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, please, this is a great chapter. Please read it, meditate on it all week long. I can't do it for sake of time. Verse 14, chapter 2, remind them. This is what we're supposed to remind us of. These things, what things? Charge them before the Lord, I'm doing it, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself. Are you presenting your members as a living sacrifice? Approved to God in Christ. A worker who needs not be ashamed. I have no shame. Christ paid for it all. I'm looking to be sanctified. I've turned my heart toward home. I want to be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. Mind, will, and emotions. I know that what I did before was wrong. I was trained by the devil. Now I want to be trained by God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to be in it to rightly divide it. You have to be asking the spirit to teach you. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Notice this. You can be a saint and argue about scripture and crazy idle babblings, and it only increases to more ungodliness because it grieves the spirit. It doesn't lead to sanctification. And their message will spread like cancer. See, the false lying stuff does. Hemonaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. Oh, you can stray concerning the truth? That's the devil's plan. If you give your life to Christ, he doesn't want you to be sanctified and used. He wants to keep oppressing and using you for him. He wants you to worship him and not be discipled. If you're not being discipled and learning what you're supposed to be doing, you're straying from the truth. Because God didn't come just to give you a home. He, give you, he came to give you hope and faith and love. He came to fill you to overflowing and use you as his vessel to reach others. Seeing that the resurrection has already passed. So what do these people do that have strayed? They teach false doctrine. It's already too late. The world's gave up on you. I'm giving up on myself. I'm going to dwell and live in the tombs. I'm just going to stay dead. They spread false doctrine. Christ is still going to look to save the lost. He's still here today. And he wants to use you, not because of anything you have, but because he wants to put his faith in you. And he wants you to be faithful to tell others. And they overthrow the faith of some. Stray concerning the truth. And then overthrow, capsize, shipwreck the faith of some. So your faith can be overthrown? Really? That's the devil's mission is to overthrow your faith. So you don't grow. Nevertheless, the solid foundation, Jesus Christ of God, stands having this 
seal, the Holy Spirit seals you. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name under the authority, character, nature, and will of Christ, the Messiah, depart from iniquity. Depart from wrongfulness of character. That's sanctification again. Have your character, your mind, will, and emotions be changed by the truth of the word of God. But in a great house, God has a great house. There are many vessels of gold and silver. Gold becoming like Christ. Silver redemption, just redeemed. But also of wood and clay and some of some for honor and some for dishonor. There comes the question for sanctification. Do you just want to be get in smelling like smoke? Or do you want to be a vessel of honor in God's house? You know, and, and it, it's kind of like, oh my goodness, never maturing, never growing up, never understanding what, where honor comes from. You know, like it's like a child that's in their parents' house and they keep throwing a fit about getting parented. They keep throwing a fit about getting a spanking, but they keep doing the same wrong stuff. And you explain to them, well, if you don't do that, you won't get a spanking. No, you're bad. You're giving me a spanking. Listen, because you, you, until you admit that your name is Jacob, you'll keep getting the spanking. You have to admit and ask God for help. You have to admit that these, all these things are demonic that we're filling our house up with, that we're the Gadites living on the wrong side. We're in the tombs. Most of the church is still chasing the world. Still chasing swine, which is unclean stuff, instead of chasing the pure and holy and undefiled stuff of God. And our faith has been overthrown. It spreads like cancer, false death, false religion does. But the Lord knows those are his. Therefore, 21, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, listen, you can't cleanse yourself except by the washing of the water through the word, by cooperating with God's sanctification. He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified. There it is, set apart for the master, prepared for every good work. So what should we do then, Paul? Flee from useful lust, but pursue righteousness. This is where our hearts, mind, will, and emotions should be set. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those... With those, there's your fellowship that we need, that, that the devil is trying to take from us. With those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And listen, the servant of the Lord, everybody that's pursuing God is a servant of the Lord. Everybody that's a disciple should know they're a servant of the Lord. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle able to teach, patient, in humility, what are you supposed to do humbly? Correct those who are in opposition to the kingdom of God. Correct those who are in opposition to the truth. If perhaps, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they, this I did all of this to get you to this verse right here, so that they may know the truth why? Because it sets them free. And that they may come to their senses. They may come awake or, or recovery of sight and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Listen, we're talking about Christians that are taken captive by the devil to do his will. Now, I don't know if you can be possessed. I would say no if you truly know Jesus, but you can be oppressed. And you can be beguiled in and tempted in and everything else to do the will of the devil instead of being listening to the voice of God and following God. If you don't fill your house up, you're still following the devil. You may be a vessel of dishonor and get into heaven, or you may not be saved at all. The only way we know is when we see true evidence of sanctification. Your mind, will, and emotions are being changed according to the truth of God. Your body is following the truth of God. You're looking to be a man of God, a woman of God, a family of God. Or you could be a useful idiot of the devil. And you could be taken captive to do his will. That's what I see when I see false teaching. When I see all the lies that are being taught in the church, they're taken captive. And they have a form of godliness which denies the power thereof. 
What is your name? Captive is this, listen. Taking captive to take alive, make a prisoner of war. That's what it means. You become POW in the enemy's camp and you're doing his will instead of God's will because you're not being sanctified. It means to be ensnared. It comes from a word that means a living thing. So in other words, you have been given life positionally, but in sanctification, your mind, will, and emotions. Oh, I have a right to be mad at them. I have a right to say this to them. I have a right. And you stay living in your self-life and your sin life. And your opinion is still on the throne instead of God's word. And you've been taken captive. You'll never be a proper witness or give a good testimony when you continue to treat people around you like you always have instead of treating them the way that Christ wants you to. And that's a training process. That's a long process. That's a maturing process that begins with the pure milk of the word. And then, of course, chapter 3, for all those Christians that are not going to be sanctified, you've seen 2 Timothy 3. Remember what it says? But know this, in the last days will be perilous times will come. A reduction of strength in the church because we ignore the word of God. And he goes on to say that they will deceive, be deceived and deceive even more. But the antidote is the word of God. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped and ready for every good work. I told you it's going to be a long sermon. Let's close it. Back in our text, Mark 5.14. So those who fed the swine fled. Notice there was other people there. There was more than one ambulance. There was fire trucks. There's other stuff. But it doesn't, make this, it doesn't contradict the testimony. See, there's other people there. And in Matthew, he just says something about two guys being there. But here, there's also people that are feeding swine there. And they fled. They seen what happened, and it scared them. They went into the city and the country and they went out to see and excuse me and told everybody. Listen, when your life changes and you meet Jesus, people should be talking about it. When you meet Jesus, people should be telling people, they ain't the same. They ain't dressed the same, they ain't acting the same, they ain't talking the same. He ain't hanging out with us anymore. She ain't calling me no more and gossiping. It all changes. <laughs> They become a witness, and then he becomes a witness. So people come to see what happened. Then they came to Jesus. See, when people start to investigate what happened, they come to Jesus, and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. This should make the world afraid. Listen, what was he doing? We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We've been clothed in his righteousness, and sanctification puts us in our right mind. That's what that's saying there. This demon in the Gadarenes is sitting down with Jesus. They couldn't tame him, but Jesus gave him new life. He's clothed. He's got on clothes because Matthew says he was naked when Jesus showed up. And listen, you and I are naked as can be before God. You might as well tell him your name's Jacob because we're as naked as can be. He sees it all anyway. And he's in his right mind. He's not in his left mind. He's not in a demon mind. He's actually sitting there. And he's ready to go with Jesus, follow Jesus, and be a witness for Jesus and tell everybody about Jesus. Watch this. And those who saw it, they told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine that flew off the hill. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Really? Possessed, by the way. Demon possessed means to be exercised by a demon. You don't do an exorcist to get rid of it. 
the demon's exercising him. Everything that he does when he moves, the demon is controlling it, exercising him. You would think, wow, what a miracle. This man is totally, he, he, he's sitting down. He, 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 he's in his right mind. He's got clothes on. We couldn't get him to get clothes on. That's why we were trying to get him. We didn't care if he was crazy. We just couldn't have him streaking. No, no, no. They say, leave, please. We have further herds down here, and we don't want them to die because we have some pigs down here that we don't want you to get around. If you're going to kill all of our money and all the way that we make a living, leave, Jesus. Don't mess with my career. Don't mess with the way I make money. You can give me salvation, but don't do anything else. Do you know that Jesus wants your heart? Now, I know when you go to most churches or most places, you hear most Christians teach, you think that Jesus wants your money. Jesus don't want your money. He wants your heart. Remember what he said to the rich young ruler? See, money had the rich young ruler's heart. And Jesus didn't say, sell all your goods and donate them to the church. He said, give it to the poor. Get rid of it. See, today we'll take that and go, sell it all and give it to me. It's controlling your life. My ministry will grow. Because I'll have your money. No, the Spirit of God grows ministries. The Spirit of God grows life. God doesn't want our money. He wants our hearts. He wants our obedience. Sadly, he went away. He couldn't do that. He couldn't obey God. The demons will. The sea will. The, 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 the wind will. But whatever has your heart might keep you from it if you don't give up everything to follow him. See, that's why it's a good thing when you don't have anything and all you have is the grave. This man didn't have nothing but a bunch of demons. When Jesus casted him out, he had nowhere to go, really. Look what he says. They pleaded with him. They're praying, please leave our region. We're happy here with our unclean pigs and our money. See, that's what this one world government's doing. That's what the spirit of this world is doing. It's saying, get away, Jesus. No to God. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And when he got into the boat, see, because he'll never force himself upon you. He got back in his boat. He who had, the de had been demon-possessed, he prayed, he begged him that he might be with him. See, when we've been set free, that's what we do. We begin to come to the throne and we begin to beg that we might be with him one day and like him fully. However, Jesus did not permit him. He didn't give him permission. He gave the demons permission to go into the pigs. Why won't he give this guy permission to go with him? Well, see, back on the other side of the ocean, or the other side of the sea, they're trying to make Jesus king. He's real popular because everybody wants to, to see what's going on. They want to make him king and take over and rule. They want to take care of themselves. But on this side, they want to take care of pigs and swine. And there's not going to be some huge popularity thing because he's going back to the other side. What does he tell him to do? No, go home to your friends, stay where you were at, and tell them. Become a witness. Give testimony what great things the Lord has done for you. Be thankful. Tell people how good God has treated you. Because you know what? Think about this. You might say, oh, my back hurts. Mine does too. I'm looking at you, so I'm not picking on you. You might say any number of things, but think how bad it might be if Jesus never showed up. Think how bad it might be if you're going through what you're going through right now with the loss of a father, whatever it is, single parenting, all these things I can look at the room and see. Think how bad it would be without Jesus. And then still understand the grace of God. That the devil wants it to be worse. The devil wants you to be cutting yourself with rocks and hiding in the graves and not even be allowed to talk to people 
But the demon speaks. You don't get to speak. You don't have a word. That's why I want you to understand when you read the word of God, you spend time with God, you see that he's going to get you to the other side and he loves you with never any love. He gives you a voice. You're not an echo anymore. He gives you a relationship that gives you a voice because you become an ambassador for God, for the kingdom of God. And he gives you power and might. And he gives you a sound mind. And that's what he did here. That's what compassionate means. Compassionate means the grace and mercy of God. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. It is the compassionate. It is the grace of God. And you have to finish that way also. Divine grace. So he tells him to stay there and be a witness and tell others about Christ. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. He did. He obeyed. He went. He, we were commanded to go. This man did. To ten cities. That's what Decapolis is. The Decalogue. The Ten Commandments. Ten cities. That's what was really there. We're hearing about the Gadarenes or Genesaret. But there's ten cities there. All worshiping pigs and money. And when he was given the gospel to them of what Jesus' compassion was about, they marveled. They marveled. They couldn't believe it. This is the guy that used to run around naked. They admired it. Here's the danger. I know you're tired. You're ready for me to be finished. My, my cassette tape already ran out back there, so I know I'm bound 80 minutes. Listen. Listen what they did. Listen what they did. Because this is the fear that we would have when we meet Jesus. They had admiration for his testimony. They had admiration for his witness. It doesn't say that they came to salvation. Many people admire Christ. Many people admire Christians. Many people worship from afar and they, they don't run to Jesus and surrender. They warm their hands at the fire and they think they're okay. They have admiration for the gospel. Do you know who he is? Do you know what manner of man he is? Do you know what your name is? See, because when he's in you and you're in him, you'll bear much fruit. But apart from him, you can do nothing. He is truth. And now we have to be truth to him and say, my name's Jacob. And he'll give you a new name, a new character, a new life. He'll set you free to worship him in spirit and truth. And he'll sanctify you, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have power over the demons. Thank you that we're safe as long as we stay in the boat with you. Forgive us for dipping our hands in the water beside the boat. Forgive us for our straying eyes where we look at all the glitters and think that the swine and the unclean is good for us. sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of the water through the word and give us a renewed desire to surrender to you and follow close behind help us not to be deceitful in Jesus' name amen. amen the Lord bless you you too did your tape run out